just waiting for my slides to come up. There we go. <clears throat> well, good morning, everybody. The presentation I'm going to give you now is actually in three parts. So the, the, the first part is uh, more of a story than a research finding. It's the story of my time at Homes to Heroes from 2012 to about midway through 2016. And it charts the trajectory of around about 100 veterans who either came into the program or sought assistance, assistance from the program. And, and the trajectory is something that I just formulated in my mind over a very long period of time. Um, when I was appointed to the Prime Minister's Advisory Council on Veterans Mental Health, one of the benefits there is that all the research findings that came out were, were presented to us. And then I later had an opportunity to work on the um, Australian Urban Housing Research Institute uh, study into veterans' homelessness. So, so the first part charts the, the veteran journey coming into Homes of Heroes, and it wasn't always the same as what we found in the uh, detailed homelessness study. And the, the temptation was to adjust the, init, uh, the initial part of this presentation uh, to, to have it conform with the findings of, a, of, of the, the broader research study. But I decided not to do that because what, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm telling the story of this particular cohort of veterans. So the first, the, the first part, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that and then I'll lead into uh, how I became to be in, involved in Disaster Relief Australia and, and why. And then I'm going to talk about um, the, the broad uh, study into homeless veterans in Australia. And one of the key uh, lessons I learnt from that study that, that, that has not been widely extrapolated. So th this is my model, and, and, and you would expect that the, the ADF has a better, a better overall well-being uh, than the Australian public because they're carefully screened and selected, healthy soldier effect and all of that sort of stuff. Um, What, what I found is people coming into Homes of Heroes, if that works, that their story always started well before a clinical diagnosis. When they came out of the military, there, there was a point at which they started to trend down. And it was always characterised by an intense sense of loss. Things like, I used to be somebody, um, do you know what I used to do, that sort of thing. Uh, a, a profound sense of uh, lack of importance, lack of value. And those sorts of things would start to combine and they'd start to lose confidence in their ability. And, and also a, a real sense of despondency. Despondency is the word I, I use because often they were, they were sub-threshold for, for a diagnosis. But these things would, would start to uh, in, increase. So despondency would lead to depression, which would lead to more drinking, which puts more strain on the marriage which leads to more drinking, which leads to more depression, and things would start to, to spiral very, uh, fairly quickly. Um, the, the, the other thing about people coming out of, uh, uh, coming out of transition at that transition point is I, I learned that service is enough. It didn't matter whether you deployed overseas or whether you had been injured in service. I saw people who were just as sick regardless of their service. If you got your leg broken in Afghanistan or got it broken in training to Kapuka, the injury was the same, and I found the same effect with mental health. The symptoms of the illness were the same, regardless of where you got them. The difficulty for the people who were injured in training is they feel an extra sense of guilt. Oh, I wasn't injured overseas. I was only injured in training. And I found that a very difficult thing to overcome. So we always had a saying, Ser service is enough. You did what your country asked you to do. How you got injured is, is not your fault. Um, so they start, they start out with, 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 with this, at this point of, of loss of self, loss of team, loss of mission, and a sense of despondency, and they start, and they start to move down. Okay. Then underlying mental, health, mental illness started to come to the, uh, to, uh, to the boil. And I, I used to call it the trife trifecta at Homes of Heroes. PTSD, anxiety, and depression. They, they seem to have all three. They check the boxes. Well, one of the... the key consequences of poor mental health was social isolation. I found that these people, um, as they became sicker, tended to set fire to all of the relationships around them and became increasingly socially isolated. Substance abuse was nearly ubiquitous, um, mostly alcohol, often an, a combination of alcohol and prescription medications, a lot of doctor shopping, um, and then uh, illicit drugs, and, and just as I was leaving Homes of Heroes, we were starting to see ICE uh, come in, ICE use come in to the organisation, particularly with 
younger veterans, but not in greater numbers. The, the, the difficulty with ICE is it's, it's just an altogether different um, effect. You, you can reasonably anticipate what someone will do if they're drunk or drugged or in hell, but when they're on ICE, they become psychotic, and it, it, it was a very difficult factor uh, for us to deal with. The, the other, the other problem that was leading to homeless very commonly is, is financial problems, and, it's, and, it, and it may sound self-evident, but this fed into the part of the larger picture of mental health problems, because I used to be someone, I had a great job, now the best I can do is work outside of, of, of a bank. Um, and as we increase, uh, as you in, in, uh, decrease in wellbeing and move further down this scale, your ability to help yourself becomes less and less. So people, as they move down this scale, uh, become less able to help themselves. Um, and financial difficulty certainly became a big factor and that would increase um, co compound uh, mental illness and people could very quickly find themselves homeless. Uh, sorry, one other thing with financial problems often related to risk-taking behaviour as well, things like, things like gambling. So we would see risk-taking behaviour as they move down this spectrum. And then physical health. Now the thing about physical health is, is there, there is a link between physical health and mental health. M may seem obvious, but there, there were two, two factors, or three really. One is pe pe people were very disjointed. There was no continuity of care. The doctor shopping, and often if you go to a medical centre, you don't see the same doctor all, all the time. So they, they had very little continuity of care. Um, and th th this is where uh, say I saw physical injuries becoming mental health injuries, particularly if, if they had a perceived fight with the system. Now, now some t sometimes they were just not able to navigate the DVA system. As I said, as we, as we get sicker and move down the wellbeing scale, your ability to help yourself becomes less. So if a person can't access a good advocate, they can't fill out the forms, leads to financial problems, they can't access the treatment they need, and everything is spiralling now. Um, and, and, and then, you get that additional effect of, well, the system that's there to help me is rejecting me. And that's when people start to hate, hate DVA. Um, a, a, another problem I saw is if people didn't get a good advocate, they come in with a knee injury and they need treatment for their knee injury right now, and the advocate might say, well, we're going to start from your head and go to your toes. And suddenly, something that could have probably been accepted quite quickly and they sought treatment for becomes this endless journey of doctors installed in paper Meanwhile, this person's suffering chronic pain and their, and their mental health is declining because they're not getting the treatment and DVA won't help me and, and, and on and on it goes. So they would continue down this spiral until at some point a crisis occurred. Now, the, the, the only thing on this slide at the moment that, that is from the uh, uh, Uhuri study is the one-year time frame. So, uh, the, the, that study found that, that the most dangerous period for a person becoming homeless is within one year of, of coming out of service. And I'll talk more about, about some of the commonalities. So I, I always argued from my lay, my lay view when I, was, when I was running this and mapping this in my mind, that as you progress down this trajectory and you hit a crisis and you can, can become homeless, just a little bit further along is suicide. And I'll show you how it equates more in a moment. So, it's very important to note that not everybody ends up on this trajectory. From all of the research I've looked at, I, I estimate about 20% 20 20 of veterans will end up on this trajectory, and not all of them will make it to crisis point, homelessness or suicide. You can get off this trajectory. Um, I, I'm living proof. I, I've lived experience with PTSD, and I got off this trajectory with good treatment. Um, in, in fact, there's a very important story we have to tell, and that is that many veterans make a very successful transition. As Gwen just said, we, we, we are not all broken, and it's, it's an important story to tell. If you say veteran in Australia, the picture people conjure up is a really old bloke with medals or a dejected, broken person sitting in the gutter, and that, and that is not true. So one of, the, one of the things we work at very hard in Disaster Relief Australia is to try and change this narrative. Veterans have incredible skills. They're some of the best trained people in the world. And we need to uh, not only convince Australia, but we actually have to convince veterans too that you still have value when you leave the military. And it's an important story. Um, the, 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 the other important thing is I, I, I know that one of the research studies said that 
um, ab about 50% of people leaving the ADF experience mental health problems. And, and that's true, but, but the other thing that study said is that the vast majority of those people access help very, very quickly. And so even people facing significant challenges with good treatment early on can overcome and go on to have a, have a productive life. And, and that is a message we have to tell over and over again. There's always hope. And the vast majority of people make, make a transition successfully. So we've got the one year time frame. Now I very deliberately put a 20 year time frame there as well because th there's a couple of things that prolong the decline in wellbeing in my experience here. One of, it, one of them was that sometimes people would come out and they, they would go into a great job and they, they would really like their job and they had, they had meaningful engagement and they would push through and they had issues and then I would hear stories like, I went to work you know, and, I, and I worked all day and I come home and I would just crash and I, and I wouldn't be able to cope when I got home and get up and go to work again and they could make it through the day. But they were still on the slope. Others sought clinical treatment. Um, they, they, were re they recognised mental disorder when they came out of, of the ADF very quickly and they got treatment, but they didn't have meaningful engagement. There's nothing purposeful in their life. So if you have either of those two, but, the, but those risk factors are still in play, it just prolongs, I wouldn't say the inevitable, but it, it, it prolongs the risk of you moving down this, well, uh, th this trajectory. Now, the, the reason I've chosen the 20-year time frame is because if you look at the bell curve of the 65,000 Vietnam veterans who served in Vietnam, the peak of them lodging claims with the Department of Veterans Affairs is 20 years after the war. Uh, that's a, a warning for all of us. 20 years after war, they, they hung in there until they started lodging claims. So I'd like to talk a, a little bit ab about crisis. So the, the, the guys com coming into Homes of Heroes, they'd started with, with despondency and intense loss of self. They, they ended up on this, this uh, cumulative snowball that can take a long time, it can happen very, very quickly. The research says it happens within 12 months, just like suicide. Um, and then at some point, there is a crisis. Now, not everyone that came into Homes of Heroes uh, came in at crisis point, but, but the vast majority did. So what is a crisis? Let's look at it. So the, the number one factor that led to homelessness is family breakdown. Uh, seven, uh, in increases are factored by seven, without, without question. Um, whenever I spoke to these people, the number one thing that had, that had resulted in, their, in becoming homeless was, was family breakdown. Now, I was very naive, naive when I started Homes of Heroes in 2012. I, I was just a veteran um, in, in rehab. I'd been wounded in action in Afghanistan, and I, I met a veteran at a, at a a remembrance function in New South Wales in Australia, just like I am now. And he told me he was homeless. And I, and I just, what do you mean? And I couldn't believe it, but it turns out he was living in a park in Bondi. Um, and that angered me so much that I ended up founding a charity called Homes for Heroes. It didn't even have a name for the first seven months because I didn't care what we called it as long as we were doing the right thing. And I'd actually like to acknowledge Nikki Young, who's sitting up the back here, who now runs Homes for Heroes, if you'd like to chat to her later. She's doing a fantastic job. So family breakdown, eight months into Homes of Heroes, I got a call from a wife who said, basically, my husband went to Afghanistan, he came back, I have no idea who he is, he's, he's violent, he drinks all the time, can you take him? And that was the first time I'd heard the other side of the story because I'd been so focused on helping these veterans coming into uh, Homes of Heroes and they, they just take an intense amount of energy because they're so unwell. Um, and it was a real eye-opener. Um, and then I listened to what she had been through and, and I just couldn't believe it. The, the difficulty I had um, with, with families is that either they, the, the, the same level of service available to, them, to a veteran is not available to the family. It's gotten much, much better. They can access uh, non-liability health cover, et cetera, et cetera. It's much better. But they didn't know the, where to get the help. That was the, the, the major issue whenever I had the opportunity to speak to a family, and it was always very hard because it would be like me speaking to your ex-wife, usually we got them to speak to legacy. Um, we, if, you've, if I was allowed to talk to the family, it, everything they needed was there, but they just had no idea how to access it. And, uh, and, and, and there's no doubt that if we had have supported that family unit early on, that you know, this trajectory would have, would have stopped much sooner. But it wasn't the only crisis. The other one was trouble with the law. 
very often DUI uh, violence. Um, interestingly, you can, it's actually not hard to get a pro bono lawyer to defend a veteran for these uh, cases, but the, the number one law issue that veterans have is family law because of the family breakdown, and you can never find a pro bono lawyer to represent someone in family law. Um, Hospitalisation and suicidality. So, as I said, not everybody that came into Homes of Heroes was in crisis, but every suicide attempt we had, and we had them all the time, happened in this period. While they were in crisis, within about the first two weeks of them coming into Homes of Heroes. So, it took a while to stabilise them, but, but it's very interesting, as this snowball effect happened and the crisis occurred, that's when we had problems with suicide, and I'll talk about trying to arrest that uh, in a minute. No, actually, I'll talk about it now. So people in crisis, they're totally unable to care for themselves. The, 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 this is a, this is a, a compound uh, issue, and they're no longer able to resolve the issues by themselves. All of our suicides occurring at this point. Now, what we learnt is, if someone's suicidal, the correct thing to do is call triple zero. So, so early on, we'd put, put them in an ambulance, send them to Manly Hospital. The fastest turnaround was about four hours. Put them in get a call from Manly Hospital, can you come and pick them up? Because the public health system is just not set up to deal with mental health issues. It's terrible. Um, so, so, you know, I, I never, we never had a, a, a suicide attempt that we sent to, to hospital that wasn't released within about 24 hours. Um, so, so we had to deal with them. Um, the, the, other, the other interesting thing that we learned over time is if, if you are in this crisis period, it, the, the care available to you, funded by, D, by DBA, is phenomenal. But accessing it is difficult. Because people coming in at crisis, if they're drunk or if they're under the effects of, of drugs, the private clinics won't admit them. So we found that we actually had to sell the patients to the clinic to try and get them in there to, to stabilise them. Because they needed, they, at that point, they needed to be in hospital. They were that unwell. Uh, and the rule of thirds. So, so what I learnt over four years of dealing with veterans, and some of them had been chronically homeless, some of them were just new homeless, uh, you know, young and new, is that they tended to fall in one of three categories. Either they bounced back very quickly, once they stabilised, we got them the right treatment, we found them a job if they were ready for it, and they would tend to just bounce back and respond very well and, and, and move out and move on with their life. There was another third who the best we will ever do is provide them a safe place to live out the rest of their life. Now, they want to go to the pub at 10 o'clock in the morning. We're never going to change it. Doesn't mean we didn't try. But we had to accept that the best we would do for that third is provide them a safe place so they can do what it is they want to do with, with their life. And then there's a the middle third. They're on the long road and will go either way. And it's really hard to tell. You, you put a lot of effort into them uh, and they up and down and two steps forward, two steps back, and you, and you, and you just don't know. But I must say, for everyone that bounced back and moved on, the feeling of seeing a person recover like that and regain their life made it all worth it every time. Okay, so just just a little bit on accessing treatment. As I said, the, the, the amount of treatment available is actually quite, is actually quite phenomenal. Um, the, the difficulty is in accessing it. When, when they're in crisis, it is, it, it is that difficulty of trying to get them into the private health system. They can't do it themselves. Uh, when, when they're on the, the, the slippery slope above, the, the help is there, but, but it is also difficult to access. And, and what I find is that people don't realise that you might not like the first psychologist you meet. It might take you six before you get to the one that works for you and is using the right systems and process. So the, 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 the treatment is available. It's just not, not always easy to access. And uh, Professor Zachary Steele once told me that uh, about a third of people don't respond to uh, conventional treatments to uh, PTSD and, and other disorders, which may explain the third that just don't recover in homes for heroes. But regardless of that, the, 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 point, the point is the time to intervene. Whenever I trace back through these people's history, the time to intervene was there. Right after they came out, 
and before they started to, or just as they started to turn down. And if we had have intervened there with meaningful engagement and uh, treatment in most cases, I think we would have kept them off the slippery slope. By the time they're getting down to the bottom of the crisis, it's too late. Their whole life has unraveled. And you've got to rebuild it all from scratch. A third of them won't recover. Just one other thing I'll point out at, at, at this point. So if you, if you look at where people in the ADF are on the, on the wellness scale, what we know now is if you're 18 to 24 years old, medically discharged, less than a year in service, where do you think you are on that welfare scale coming out? Way down. Uh, in, interestingly, it's exactly the same demographic for homelessness. Okay, so finding the missing link. Um, Homes for Heroes was very well resourced. I could provide people food, accommodation, clothing, anything they need. The one thing I could never give them was a reason to get up in the morning. And without it, without them feeling valued, very, very difficult to make progress. So this is a quote taken from the Veteran Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy. I think it might actually have been the 2019 version. But it talks about the protective factors in ADF service, and they're absolutely right. And those intangibles of a sense of purpose and mateship uh, and, and belonging and being able to make a difference, um, I, I believe, is, is the key to whether or not people make a, a successful transition. It's the reason to get up in the morning. Which brings me to Disaster Relief Australia, where I currently am now. So did you ever hear Ronald Reagan say, the scariest thing a person can hear is, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. <laughs> so what, what, what I learned from my time at uh, Homes of Heroes is, is the best way to help a veteran is to actually ask them to help someone else. And that is the model of Disaster Relief Australia. So it, it enables us to reach in to veterans and say, hey, we need your help. And then quietly in the background, we can help them. And I'll show you a testimony in a second. Um, if you just look at this picture, look at the picture in the background, it looks like a war zone. So veteran skills are actually ideally suited to be in a disaster environment, but it's not a war zone. And in fact, in, a war, in war, I saw more humanity than I did anything else. And veterans are incredible at being able to engage people who have lost everything and talk to them and empathise with them and help them. One of, the th one of the things about the disaster environment in, in particular is the opportunity to have a direct impact on someone else's life. So we ask veterans to help other people, and I've seen this happen a thousand times over, where a veteran will go to someone's house and that person is literally on their knees because they've just lost everything, crying. Our people hook in, pick through the ashes, maybe they're looking for a, a wedding ring that's lost or some photos. And by the end of the day, that person who was literally on their knees crying, he's standing up, walking around, joking with everybody. And what we've actually done is help them take the first step in their recovery. And once you've taken one, you can take another and another. But that first one's the hardest. And veterans see that with their own eyes. I just want to put a, a quote up for you to read from, from one of our veterans. So I think the first line captures it really well. <clears throat> this is a, a, a young veteran who, had, who I think did three tours of Afghanistan and was working over the Black Summer fires and he spent the, his, his whole time helping other people. And then what we do is, as, uh, at the end of each day, we just grab someone walking past, say, just, just come and write a reflection. W whatever's on, the, on your mind, just, just write it down for us. And, and, and this is what he wrote. And the first line captures it well. I, I think I actually helped myself more than I helped others, even though he spent the entire week serving the community. Our veterans are incredibly selfless. They join as volunteers. They have service in their blood, always looking for an opportunity to continue to serve. Now, one of the other things that happens on these deployments, um, I, I've had people say, well, what about people with PTSD? Don't you make them worse? Well, actually, no, because, like I said, a, a disaster environment isn't a war environment. It's also not a work environment. It's a safe environment. And we find the opposite happens. It actually desensitizes our people 
to, to these environments. It helps them come down, bring down their suds level and decreases anxiety. It's also the only place I know we can get a group of alphas talking positively about mental health. So at the end of each day, we have a debrief and you'll get a, a bunch of people standing around the fire and one of them will say something like, mate, I, I, I've been stuffed for years. Now I'm, I'm seeing this doc up in Brisbane. You should go see him, mate. He's, he's helped me out a lot, that type of thing. That is a positive conversation about mental health. And that's always what's going on in the background. I'll just add, when I, when I left Homes for Heroes, I was actually going to go and work in the com commercial world. I thought the, the last thing that the world needs is another ex-service organisation. There's three and a half thousand of them or something. Um, but when I looked at this one, well, there's actually nothing like, like this out there that's saying, hey, veterans are, are highly valued assets and, and we need to take those skills and put, and put them to work and we need to demonstrate to society that veterans are fantastic. Who, who else would you want in your front yard when you have a disaster? But what I've found increasingly over time is we have to prove it to the veterans themselves. And while they're doing this stuff, they rediscover their confidence and they find that they do have value and the skills that they have uh, do translate into the, into the civilian environment and it's very, um, very, very, very warming for me to watch people to grow and rediscover themselves and find their confidence again and realise that they, they have value and they do matter and they can make a real difference to a person's life. So I'm just going to move on now to talk about the uh, Australian Housing and Urban Research Institute study. Now that was commissioned by the Department of Veterans Affairs and we work with the Social Policy Research Centre at Union New South Wales and part of what I'm about to present is a presentation that I co-presented with the Union New South Wales once that report was released. But there was, there was a, a very important lesson I learned in, in that study um, and, and it was kind of lost in the report because all anyone wanted to know from that report is how many veterans are homeless, how many veterans are homeless. That, that, that was the entire focus of uh, anything, but we, we, we missed an opportunity, and I'm going to spell it out uh, here in a second. Um, and, and that is the opportunity to intervene even earlier than the point I said we should have in, intervened at. So this is something I learned after my time at Homes for Heroes, and I'm going to explain uh, about this intervention point, and it's not about, is the chief still here? You're not about to get a kick in the shins. It's not about battle smart, it's not about the resilience programs that the ADF are doing. The ADF have excellent transition uh, coaches now. DVA is not what it used to be. The, the system has come a long way. But, but there is a very important piece of, of information that we found in this study and I'll just go into it in a second. So the findings of the national study into Homeless Amongst Veterans projects funded by DVA as I said. Now what I intended to do here what I was originally going to do, because I have always said, uh, as I said at the start, if you, if you end up on that, what I call the slippery slope, and you're heading down that trajectory and you hit crisis point, you end up homeless, well, just a little bit further down the road is, is suicide. I was going to put the precursors for homelessness on one side of this page and the precursors for suicide on the other, but there was no point because they're the same. So lower rank, sh shorter, shorter periods of service, uh, psychological distress, uh, you know, mental illness, suicidal ideation, uh, ex-service, have transitioned within 12 months, have been medically discharged, all exactly the same as the suicide study, likely to be younger, not in a relationship, lower education levels, um, uh, and experience social isolation, risk-taking behaviour and, and that sort of thing. Let me just go on. So. The, the, the interesting thing, you ever have one of those dawning moments where you can remember where you were when this happened? So we were, we were looking at the data from uh, in this study, and, and for, for those of you who've worked on this, I have grossly oversimplified the first two studies here. So the first one was the military uh, health outcomes. So, so that was a study that was done in 2010, and I know it looked at more than what I've got up there, but only so much room on the slide. And then we took that uh, that study that had been done in 2010, that was people who were in service, and they're still serving. And then we were able to cross-match it or link the data with people who had tra transitioned out of defence in 2015. And what we found that there was, uh, I'll just read it, a, te a temporal precedence for associations between homelessness, PTSD symptoms, psych psychological distress, 
alcohol consumption and anger, as well as deployment experience. So what, what this is saying is that people who self-reported certain symptoms in 2010 who were sub-thresholds, so they weren't diagnosed, and there were things like alcohol consumption. Anger was a really uh, marked um, in indicator. People who had self-reported in 2010 could be linked with those symptoms to, a, to homelessness five years later. In other words, we could predict the pattern. It was there in the data. Now, that was lost, and that, that is a very, very important thing, because if you can link data that predicts homelessness, you can link data that predicts suicide, you can link data that predicts um, uh, the, the prevalence of mental illness and the development of disorder in these longitudinal studies, and there is that, we all know early intervention is the key. Well, here's the opportunity to intervene before it even comes up as a disorder. PTS before it's the D. Um, and, and just that bottom line, the, the bottom line is actually is a quote out of a, a, a submission to, to a study that the Phoenix uh, Institute uh, ha, had put in, and, and, and it's just recognising the importance of those long, longitudinal studies. Because although I tried to shout it from the rooftops that, hey, we found a predictive pattern, it was kind of lost. Because all anyone wanted to talk about was how many homeless veterans there are. Now, this number is can be a little bit misleading. We found that the homeless veterans are divided into thirds. There's a third who were just homeless for a very, very short period of time, probably because of poor planning, typical diggers. There's a, there was a, a third who were chronically homeless over a longer term, and then, of course, there's the third in the middle who were transitionally homeless, so I think it was three, three, three to 12 months, or something like that. Um, when, I, when I talk about this study, and I talk about homelessness, I try not to focus on how many veterans are homeless, because the only number that really matters is one. While ever we've got one veteran that's homeless, or we've got one veteran that's committing suicide, we have work to do. Thank you very much.